right, let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, and that's where we're going to find ourselves today. Today's the third sermon of a sermon series called Stable, and we did that on purpose for two reasons. First of all, the word stable, we know that Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, was born in a stable, right? And so that's important, but also we know that Jesus, who was born in a stable, came to give us a stable life. We can live our lives in stability and peace because the Lord is with us. So we chose, instead of using a traditional Christmas passage, how many of you know the whole book is really about Jesus? The whole book is. So Philippians 4 is where we're at. And we've had a couple of sermons already. The first one was about forgiveness. Pastor Neil did a great job reminding us that we who have been forgiven much should love much and should forgive those that have sinned against us. And then last week, Derek did an amazing job of helping us remind remind us of our perspective and how our perspective should lead us to live joy-filled lives. And today, I have the privilege of speaking to you about peace. And peace, if there's anything that we need in this world that we live in today, it is peace. And I'm here to tell you that the Bible describes a way and ways that we can find peace no matter what's going on around us. And that's what we're going to focus in on here today. So let's look at Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9. And we're going to read this out of the NIV version, New International Version. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. Lord, we thank you for what's already happened. Your name has been lifted high. And Father, we also believe that your spirit is here, ever present, that each one of these individuals who are followers of Jesus Christ brought him with them. And so, Lord, we thank you that as we have worshiped you together, that your word promises us that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst of us. And so, Lord, we know that you're with us today. We ask that you would minister to us through the word, that you would give me the ability to communicate the things that you desire to have communicated. We pray that you would be glorified above all else in our lives. And we do ask that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, that you would teach us how to walk in your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody wants to turn the house lights on. That would be great. Back in the back there. I still remember 23 years ago having my first ever panic attack. I didn't know what was happening at the time. I didn't know to call it a panic attack. I just knew something was not right. Something was very wrong. My wife and I, along with our family, went on vacation to the beach after a very devastating season in our life. Um, Things that were happening on the outside that were affecting us in our lives. And we were standing in Walmart when it hit me. And I'm going to attempt to describe, just in a small way, what it felt like to have that first panic attack. My ears began to ring loudly as if to drain out all of the sound that was around me except for what was happening on the inside of me. My vision began to shrink in its scope so that it seemed I could barely focus on anything else around me. Everything was moving inward, inward, inward. A great sense of dread came over me, overwhelming, overwhelming dread like I had never experienced before 
in my life, the ball that you feel in your throat when you get nervous seemed to be choking me at this point. As my chest began to fill with pain and tension, and I felt like that I was going to lose my ability to breathe. About that time, I began to sense my heart beating. I could feel my heart beating like it was electricity pulsing through my body. This had never happened to me before that I could recall, but it felt so surreal, like something was happening that was very, very bad. My face began to feel flush, like I was having a 104-degree fever, and then I began to shake. I began to shake without control, and I began to sweat profusely. All of this probably within just a matter of a few seconds. At that moment in time, I felt like I began to be separated from my body, like I was somehow in another place, even though I was there and experiencing all of this, it was like I was watching it happen to somebody else. It was, felt like I was in, on the outside looking in. And everything kept screaming at me, this is how it's going to be now. This is your new normal. This is it. By now, my thoughts began to catch up with what I was feeling and Everything within me said, you're dying, you're dying, you're dying. And then it said, get out of here. My body, my mind, everything in me said, get out of this place, run out of here, get out of here now, you're dying, you're dying. I really don't remember much after that except for somehow getting into the car with my wife and heading back to where we were staying. And although those feelings and emotions and pains and description that I just described to you continued for a season of time, in a few minutes, it began to let up, and I began to feel a little bit more like myself. Only this time, I was completely exhausted. It was like I hadn't slept in a very, very long time. So I laid down to sleep, but I couldn't find sleep because I was so disturbed about what I had just experienced. Some of you may be able to relate fully with what I just described to you because you've had similar things happen to you. You have felt the same way that I have just explained that I felt. Maybe you have felt it in different forms or fashions. Maybe you've been overwhelmed and it's expressed itself in different ways. Maybe you've turned those feelings inward and become depressed and gotten stuck in a place of depression. Maybe you haven't personally experienced it, but you know somebody very close to you that has dealt with this same type of feeling, the same emotion, the same experience. And you, being the good person that you are, are trying with everything within you to try to help them and strengthen them and assist them so that these types of things don't continue to happen. It seems like you feel like you're out of control. They're out of control. The world's out of control. And there's a third category of people. Maybe you've never experienced anything like this and you don't know anybody that's ever experienced anything like this. Just to let you know, the rest of us hate you. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only only kidding. I'm only kidding. We mostly don't hate you. We, We love you. We love you. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. We need to know about this because it's real, and it happens more and more often. Anxiety, I believe, since 9-11, has ramped up in this nation and around the world more than almost any other ailment that you can imagine. The number one prescribed medicine by far in this nation is antidepressants. It's a huge issue. P- 
people are experiencing things like I just described, not just once, but over and over and over again. In the weeks and months following that experience that I had, I had several other times. And I grew up in a church that believed that the only way for you to recover from something like that was for you to be healed miraculously by God. Now, here's the thing. We know that Jesus heals miraculously, and he could have done that for me. But for me, it didn't happen instantaneously. It was a process. It was a journey that he took me through. And to be honest with you, 23 years later, I'm still on that journey. I'm still in the process. Thank God I don't find myself often in any kind of scenario that's similar to what I just described to you. But for me, it's been a journey. It's taken time. I've had to learn some things. I've had to discover that God has given wisdom to men and women to help people who are going through things like this. And obviously, the Word of God is also filled with power and might and authority and answers. And so we're going to look at the Word we just read this morning. We're going to digest it together and look at what this tells us. Um, But before we do that, I just want to say this. I want you to have an underlying understanding today behind everything that I say. There are some people who have physiological, chemical, or psychological issues that cause them to struggle in ways that aren't easy to understand or cure. We always recommend seeing a professional if there are concerns that the issue that you're dealing with or somebody that you know is dealing with is greater than simply choosing whether or not to obey the scriptures. Let's be careful with our judgment. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. Let's make sure that we are showing mercy and kindness toward others. And sometimes that even means toward ourselves. And if we need help from a source, not outside of God, because God has provided these resources for us, let's not be afraid to ask for it. Thank God, God sent me to an emergency room one day when I thought for sure that it was the end of everything. And the nurse practitioner who happened to be a believer looked at me and said, what is going on with you? And I said to her, you're supposed to tell me that. And she said, no, what is going on? And I found myself reciting to her everything that I had held on the inside, thinking that I had to be strong for everybody else when I myself had put myself, because of the circumstances, in a very, very dangerous place. What I learned from her and others after that has led to me not being completely, it's not like I never deal with anxiety, but it's led to me learning and experiencing what it means to walk in the peace of God that passes all understanding. And that's what we want to focus on here this morning. Are you ready for that? Okay, let's go together. So the Greek word translated anxious means to be pulled in different directions. If you've ever felt anxious, you may have two thoughts that are coexisting or more than that, things that are pulling at you in different ways. So one thought is hope. There is is a side of you that there's hope that lives and resides on the inside of you. And so when you begin to feel nervous or anxious, that hope pulls on you. But the other hand is fear. And fear screams loudly and pulls at you without relent. And sometimes it's hard to keep that in check so that you can move over to the side of hope. Am I right? It's just like anything. The thing that screams the loudest seems to get the most attention. And so fear and worry can affect us. It can give us headaches, neck pain, uh, ulcers, back pain. Worry affects our thinking, our digestion, and even our coordination. I could go on and on and on, but we won't focus much on the negative today. 
It's interesting, the only do not in this whole passage, everything else is do this, do this, do this. But the first thing is do not. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, here's the good news. God is not cruel. And if he would give us a commandment like this as followers of Jesus Christ, there's no way he would give that to us unless he would also give us the ability to walk this out. He doesn't set us up to fail. He's not a cruel father. Amen? So as we think about this, let's talk about it together. Do not be anxious about anything. Holy Spirit through Paul tells us not to be anxious. We're surrounded by anxiety bombs, aren't we? These phones. (laughs) Don't get me started on the phones. How many of you actually feel separation anxiety if you realize that you've left the house without your phone? How many of you feel that if you go to the bathroom and you don't have your phone? Don't raise your hand, please. Our phones are simply tools. They can be used for good and they can be used for evil. If we find ourselves mindlessly scrolling for hours and observing plates of food from around the world. I'm obsessed with watching them cut the, st- the cooked steaks with that knife, you know, and you're waiting for the reveal and all of a sudden, ah, you can almost taste it. You can smell it if you could, you know. But what is it that we, that we take time focusing in on? right? What about the news? The news is helpful, hopeful, right? Anybody here a part of an HOA? That's another anxiety-free experience, am I right? I'm almost over that. Anybody attempted to build a house lately or renovate a house or anything in that world. (laughs) It's a lot. There's a lot to think about, a lot to consider. And here's the reality. Can we be honest? We love to worry. Oh, not me. I never worry. Okay. We're going to preach next week about lying. (laughs) Give you a week's reprieve. If you don't want to come next week, that's fine. (laughs) We worry. We worry all the time. Parents lay in bed at night. Their kid's supposed to be home at midnight. They show up at 1.30. We worry. The doctor says there's a problem. He's going to need to do some further testing to confirm what the problem is. We worry. We worry. How bad is it? Will I recover from it? How long before I know? There's a new owner that takes over our company and We're worried what that means for us. Will we still have our jobs? What will the new owner be like? Will the ownership change everything? Will I still have a job? I imagine Twitter these days is riddled with this kind of thinking. School feels overwhelming. These classes are way too difficult. We worry. Will I pass this class? Will I make it? What happens to my grade point average? Will I be able to graduate as planned? We worry. We love to worry. We face these same kinds of circumstances and situations every day, and we find ourselves, if we're not careful, in constant turmoil and fear. And there are some that feel so overwhelmed by worry that it literally controls your lives. And those are the ones that I was saying in the beginning Don't be afraid to ask for professional help. Sometimes you just need to talk to somebody. We counsel here at the church, the pastor's counsel, and we also refer Christian counselors in the area that we trust. And we don't have all of the answers, but we try to be good listeners. So if you find yourself in a spot where you just need to talk to somebody, we're here. Call the office, email the office. Text one of us and let us know. We'd love to meet with you. No judgment, just a listening ear. 
The Holy Spirit through Paul gives us hope that we as believers in Jesus Christ can find peace in the middle of an anxious world. How do you think it was for the Philippians in the time when Paul was writing this letter? He's in prison in Rome at the time, falsely accused, falsely charged, placed in the prison, waiting to face the Roman leader. And as he's in that prison, he's writing this letter of hope and joy to a church where not that long ago, Paul had spent a few hours in the deepest and darkest of dungeon cells. He was there, and you can imagine all of the creepy things that you can imagine in your mind, the spiders, the snakes. The, there is, they, they do believe that even there may have been sewer water that would flow through that area where the prisoners were. It was not a place like Morgan County Prison. It wasn't like that. It was very vastly different from that. And so Paul, in the middle of his... And the only reason he's there is because he has dared to mention the name of Jesus. He's lifted the name of Jesus high and he's prayed for people and they've been miraculously touched and healed by God. And so he's thrown into prison so that he'll shut his mouth. But here's the thing that Paul understood. It didn't matter what his circumstance was. The Lord was with him. And so Paul and Silas, as they were probably hands and feet locked in some form of device. They look at each other, and Silas says, this reminds me of hee-haw, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Is that in the Bible? No, 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 no. If you don't know what hee-haw is later, Google it. It was special. It was real special. But Paul and Silas began to lift up praise and worship to God in the midst of that prison. And God, who was there, busted out. He busted them out. And you know what that whole thing was about? It was about one family, the jailer. Remember in Acts 16, the jailer was about ready to kill himself because he knew that if the prisoners escaped the fate that he was going to face would be worse than death. And so he was going to end it. And Paul cries out, wait, we're all here. And the jailer says to Paul and Silas, come home with me. I want you to meet my family. So he goes home with the jailer and speaks to the family. And the promise is given that he and his whole household would be saved. And God did that. And we don't know. We don't have the privilege of knowing the rest of the story. We don't know what happened in Philippi after that. But we do know that there was a church that was established that Paul wrote this letter to. And in this letter, he realizes that the same type of persecution that he and Silas were facing as they traveled and ministered in Philippi, the church of Jesus Christ was continuing to experience on a daily basis. Their lives were literally at stake. And so he writes these words to them. Do not be anxious about anything. Let's talk about the promised peace. Let's turn the corner from anxiety and move into a place where all of us desire to be, and that is a place of peace. Did you know that peace is a fruit of the Spirit? Can you say them? What are they? Good job. One of those was peace. God is the God of peace, and he gives us the gift of peace through the fruit of his Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. So how would you define peace? Peace is simple. It's simple to define. It's soundness, completeness, security, welfare, harmony, safety, and most of all, assurance. That's what peace means. We should all want peace of mind. If you don't want peace of mind, you have to ask yourself, what is wrong with me? 
I'll tell you this for sure. After I had that first panic attack, I never wanted to experience that again. And even though I did experience it again, every time that it happened, my greatest anxiety afterward was, is it going to happen again? I didn't want to experience that. We should be free to enjoy our lives. These lives that God has given us, we should be free to enjoy our family, our friends, our work, our church, our hobbies, entertainment that's good and godly. We shouldn't want to be burdened down with worries that rob us of our passion and our life, discourage us. We should want peace. And I'm going to give you three out of this passage, three types of peace that are promised to us who follow after Jesus Christ. The first one, number one, is peace with God. Peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Like we said before, Jesus, one of his names, one of his titles is the Prince of Peace. And he came to this world, and we're celebrating Christmas because of the fact that God himself, the Prince of Peace, came into this world to bring peace to this troubled world. And we are experiencing that peace if we are followers of Jesus Christ. Peace with God. We deserved his wrath. We have to remind ourselves often of where we were headed before Jesus saved us. We were headed for destruction. Our God was the God of this world, Satan himself. And Satan will find himself eventually in the lake of fire, forever removed from the presence of God. And the Bible also teaches us that those who follow Satan instead of following after Jesus will unfortunately follow after the same fate. We need peace with God. Jesus came to give it to us. He came and he lived a perfect life, the life that we could not live. And he took upon himself our sorrow, our shame, our guilt, our sin, everything that we've ever thought wrong, done wrong, our motivation that's been wrong, every word that we've spoken that shouldn't have been spoken. He took all of it upon himself and he carried it and it was so heavy upon his shoulders that he had a hard time even carrying the wooden cross. It was our sin that was burdening him not a piece of wood that he had created. And think about the fact that as he gave people the ability to make things that, like spikes, those same things that could be made to help were now made to be driven into his arms, his hands, his wrists, and into his feet. And he hangs in the balance on the cross, never Sinned, not deserving, and yet he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Those words will find their way all the way backward and all the way forward. They are eternal words. Jesus said, it is finished. And when he said it is finished, he didn't mean it's mostly finished. He didn't mean there's still some work to do. He meant it is finished. My friends, can I please suggest and suggest to us today that it's possible that we don't fully believe that. Because if we fully believed that, peace would be a part of our everyday experience. It's not enough. It was enough to pay for our sin that he died, but he rose from the dead on the third day, proving that he had defeated death, hell, and the grave. Jesus said, even the demons understand who I am, and they will bow their knee, and all of us will as well. And my hope is that we'll bow our knee on earth because that's when we're given the promise of salvation 
So how do we experience the peace with God? Simple. Number one, we have to acknowledge our need. You can go to any AA meeting, any kind of self-help meeting, and they tell you, first of all, what? You have to acknowledge that you have a problem. You have a need. Number one, I'm a sinner in need of God's grace and forgiveness. And Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not enough just to acknowledge that, but we must repent. Repent simply means to turn around, to change your mind, to be willing to acknowledge our sin to God, to turn away from our old way of living and to turn toward God. Peter said in Acts chapter 3, Repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. What is the time of refreshing? It's when God makes everything the way it's supposed to be. God did not create us to be separated from him. God created us to be in right relationship with him. Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the Garden of Eden. And God's desire is to have mankind, his people, have the same experience where we walk with him and we talk with him. There's an old song like that. He walks with me and he talks with me. The third step is to confess and believe on the Lord Jesus. He is who he says he is. We must confess that and believe it, that he did what he said that he would do to provide a way for us. Romans 10 makes it clear, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. It's not enough to believe that Jesus came to this earth as a baby. It's not enough even to believe that he died on the cross and that he rose again. We must believe that what he did paid the price for us to be restored to right relationship with God. We must believe. We must confess. And finally, and sometimes we forget this part, but it's true, we must live a transformed life by the grace of God. A prayer does not suffice. There are many people who prayed prayers as children, and since that point in time, they have, they have not walked with God. And if that's you, please acknowledge your need, repent, repent, Confess and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and allow him by his spirit to transform you so that you live a new life. Two elements of this that are very important according to scripture are water baptism. We believe that it's powerful to be water baptized, not to save you, but as an evidence that you've been saved, that you're a new creature, that you're identifying with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we also believe, the scripture teaches us, that we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we are filled with Holy Spirit, his essence, who he is, his character, his nature, his qualities, all of those things are developed in us as we yield to him. And we go, as the scripture says, from glory to glory to glory, till one day when we will be like him. That will not come until Jesus appears or we leave this life into the next. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How many of you are new creation here this morning? Amen. <laughs> Woo. Wish my, ba- my grandbabies were in here. They'd, they'd, they'd let us hear it. Did you hear them worship? Man, God's put worship in their hearts. They're not that far removed from heaven. You think about it. Their spirits came from heaven. They know in their, li- in the, in the, their little something, somehow they know. So unless you have peace with God first, there's no other peace to be found. The peace that we can find in this world outside of Jesus is false. It comes and it goes. 
it does not reside with mankind. Right? So the peace with God is number one. Number two is the peace of God. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So not only did Jesus' sacrifice as the Prince of Peace pay for us to be reunited in our relationship with God, but he also promised us that he would give us his peace, that his peace would dwell upon us and with us and in us by the Holy Spirit. John 14 tells us that. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. How does the world give? The world gives and then takes. Jesus said, I want you to distinguish the peace I'm talking about from what the world calls peace. There is no such thing as world peace outside of Jesus Christ. I know all of us probably one time or another have put that on our Christmas list or some list somewhere. I know that back in the day, whenever they'd have the Miss America pageant, you could guarantee there was a world peace going to be come out somewhere, right? But there's no peace outside of Jesus, but his peace is overwhelming. It's uncommon. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It sounds like that we have some, something to say about how we're affected by fear, doesn't it? Neither let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It sounds like permission can be granted or stopped when it comes to our will and the decisions that we make. Now, I understand, again, just reiterate, we know that there are times when things are overwhelming, you don't have any control over that. And for those types of things, let's talk to somebody. Let's reach out. Let's get some help, right? But on the daily basis, a lot of the things that pile up and that cause us to lose our peace really shouldn't if we dealt with them one at a time, right? I know when I was in the hospital a couple of years ago, I always thought, and you heard it when I talked about that first panic attack, my greatest fear was that I was going to die. And so every time that I would feel any pain in my body for months and months and months after that, I was convinced I was going to die. I couldn't drive. I couldn't uh, play with my kids. Sorry, Jordan and Hannah. Love you guys. I couldn't... Um, I couldn't make a decision. Sometimes I couldn't speak. I was so trapped in this thought process, this overwhelming feeling of dread, like something was going very, very wrong. It's a horrible place to find yourself. But when I went into the hospital, I was afraid, obviously. But what I discovered when I almost died twice, is that the Lord has put something on the inside of us. He's created systems and pathways, and our body releases different hormones and things to where we really, we don't really know what's happening fully when it's happening. I had no idea that I was as close to dying as I was. And so when I came out of the hospital, I said, well, Lord, I'm not afraid of dying. Praise God. Thank the Lord but I still felt like something was not right. And it wasn't until the last time I was in the hospital getting my final surgery, and it was during COVID and nobody was allowed to come in or out of the hospital. And I'm in the room by myself and everybody's having to do everything for me, which wasn't horrible. <laughs> it's horrible because I wanted to get up, but it wasn't horrible from the service standpoint. But you know what I realized? I had absolutely no control over anything in that moment. I couldn't do anything about it, except for B. And you know what the Lord helped me to realize? I'm not in charge. And it was that fear, the fear of losing control that gripped me so much that it literally controlled my life, weeks and months 
and years. I wonder what it is that the enemy uses against you. What fear is it that he tries to preach to you to get you to believe? There are two places that we're most vulnerable concerning peace. Our mind. How many of you know that our minds love to run around like spoiled children? I mean, talk about squirrel. I mean, they are like, our minds are crazy. If you ever exercised, if you just practiced this, if you just wrote down your thoughts for 30 minutes, every thought that came into your head, and wrote it down as you thought it. I've said this before, it'd be even better if, just, if we could just hold a, you know, our iPhone up to our head and everybody else could see all of our thoughts as we walk around. Wouldn't that be great? See them and hear them. And, you know, a lot of times we don't even consider what we think about. You mean I can choose to think about certain things and not about other things? Yes. <laughs> yes, we can. And the second area is our emotions. How many of you know that your emotions will lie to you? Your emotions will lie to you. They will influence what you believe to be true based on your perception. How many times have you been angry with somebody because you misperceived something that they said or something that they did? Let me get this. Because there was a text that was sent. And one person didn't get it, and the other person did or didn't get it. And so you're at, you're at odds with each other. You're angry with each other. Right? My friends, be careful. Your emotions are a gift from God. But when they are allowed to rule and reign in your life instead of Christ, they will take you to places that you do not want to go. Amen? So this peace, the peace of God, that is a gift that God gives us, it surpasses all understanding. It bypasses our mind and our emotions. It's greater than us, and it can fill us. The people of the world can't understand this at all. Have you ever had somebody in your workplace look at you and say, how can you be peaceful or joyful right now? You just lost your job. Or you, you just, whatever it was, whatever the horrible experience that you just had was, and yet in the middle of that, you're able to present the peace of God that passes all understanding, that doesn't make sense, that's bigger than our emotions, that overwhelms our thoughts, that's greater than our experience. It's the overall understanding of who God is bearing down on whatever this experience is that I'm going through. Because if God is allowing this to happen, then he must have something better in mind that's coming. Maybe we should talk about patience. No, no. We'll just pray about that, right? You ever prayed for patience? It'll come. <laughs> It'll come. That's a no-no. Yeah, we don't go there. So these verses promise us that in Christ Jesus, there's a peace that is available to us that will guard our hearts and minds and give us peace that can't be explained. What a great witness it is to those around us when we who know Jesus even in the most difficult points of life, can say to somebody else, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? I spent a couple hours with Cindy Skeen in the hospital yesterday. And if you know Cindy Skeen, you know you're not ministering to her. She's <laughs> ministering to you. And I always walk away from her and others like that, others like you, with such hope. She's been through a lot, and yet she still is witnessing to the nurses. She's excited about what God has next for her. She's concerned about getting home so she can take care of her mom. This is a godly woman. I hope Cindy's watching this. We love you so much. 
So let's get practical. Are you ready for this? This passage gives us three ways, three steps to find peace in every situation. It goes on to say, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So the first one is prayer. How many of us forget to pray when we begin to feel anxious? Yeah, we forget to pray. It's like we're saving the big things for God, but we're going to handle the little things. I'm here to tell you that enough little things piled on top of each other become a big thing. So why not take everything to the Lord in prayer? Talking to God about everything that concerns us and Him is the first step to victory over worry. We must keep an open dialogue with God. It is not just an hour of prayer, it's a day of prayer. Every day we stay in communication with God. Petition or supplication is more than just asking for something. It's, it's intense, it's earnest, it's extended. It doesn't let go until something changes on the inside of us. Some of you who have been involved in intercessory prayer meetings, you've been praying for something and praying strongly and urgently, urgently concerning something until you got to a point to where the peace of God rushed into the room and overwhelmed you and you knew that no matter if the circumstance had changed or not, you could move forward, you could move on, you could pray for something else. How many times do we pray until the peace of God overwhelms us? It's a promise. He will send it to us. You know, worry is prayer as well. It's just praying to the wrong God. Prayer and peace are closely connected there are times through my struggle where I couldn't speak any words of English out of my mouth. But because the Lord has, has gifted me with the gift of tongues, I was able to pray in tongues because I bypassed my mind. And it came directly from my spirit, which is never affected by anything else that I'm experiencing. Do you know that our spirits are made completely whole when we're born again? They can't be touched or moved or changed in a negative way. That's who we really are. That's the eternal part of us. We need to live more from that place than we do from our emotions or from our mind, right? Also, sometimes you need somebody else to pray for you. There's no shame in that. This church is a church that loves and if you need prayer, it doesn't matter what it is. We want to stand with you. We want to pray with you. And it's okay. James 5 says the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Now here's something I want you to consider. This hit me so hard as I was writing this. God always answers believers' prayers. And sometimes he answers them the way we want him to. God always answers believers' prayers, and sometimes he answers them the way we want him to. Isn't it interesting that to the creator of the universe, we give him like a play sheet, like a football team. We give him the play. We say, okay, if you move this and do this and do that and this and that, then I'll end up in the end zone. And God's like, really? Interesting. Interesting. Why in the world would we tell him how to do it when he knows everything? So when we pray, let's not command God or direct God. Let's talk to him like he is who he is. Let's have a little respect. Show a little fear of the Lord when we speak to him, even though we can freely come to him because he's our father. He's also God. Let's speak to him and let's believe that the answer that he gives is the answer that we need. Sometimes no is better than yes. 
You ever had a prayer answered no? And in a, a year later, two years later, you realize that was the right, that was the right answer? Here's an example of this. Some of my, one of my kids, and I will not name them, they may or may not be in the room. I think they're all here. Ha! Huh. One of my kids, I'm going to change it. My brother. <laughs> my brother was one of those guys that just would never let something go. You ever known somebody like that? If he wanted something, he was going to ask and ask and ask and beg and plead and manipulate and control until mom or dad would say, yes. There was one time in particular that our friends wanted us to go with them to the mall. We used to do that back in the day, you know, go to the mall. <laughs> and my parents said to us, you can't go today. To which I, who had a fear of the Lord and my dad's belt, said, yes, sir. My brother proceeded to say, huh? What? <laughs> why? You ever ask God why? My parents that time were gracious and they answered us. They said, we felt like the Lord spoke to us that there's going to be um, violence at the mall today. And we are keeping you home because we feel like it's for your protection. Violence. <laughs> Don't act like you never did it. Come on. I thought it. I mean, I, I was like rooting my brother on, on the inside, while I was behaving on the outside. <laughs> and we watched the news that night, and there was a kidnapping at the local mall that day. A boy was kidnapped, taken don't know the end of the story, but I do know that when we watched that, my brother and I's jaws dropped pretty low as we recognized that God, our parents' answer of no was actually better than yes. Right? How much more our Heavenly Father who knows everything, who sees everything, who's aware of everything, how much more should His answer be acceptable to us? Second thing is praise. We're moving along. Anybody heard the song Surrounded or Fight My Battles? Anybody heard that song? Okay, Michael W. Smith made it famous recently. He recorded it. And the lyrics are simple. It just says, this is how I fight my battles. And then it says, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Does it ring a bell now? I can sing it for you if you want. <laughs> Scott could come up and do an interpretive dance to it. Is Kelly here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's not Servant's Heart. We'll wait for, we'll do that next year. But the song didn't originate with that Smith, not Michael W. Smith. It originated with Alyssa Smith. Uh, she was a worship leader, and she was in a prayer meeting with six people. And as she was in that prayer meeting with six people, these 17 words dropped into her heart. And now... Churches around the world are singing these words, and Christians are being encouraged by these words. So where did she get the idea from, the concept? Somebody in the prayer room mentioned Jehoshaphat. You remember the story from 2 Chronicles 20 about Jehoshaphat, about three enemy armies that were coming against them, the nation of Israel, and Jehoshaphat was afraid, as we would be as well. He was nervous, he was concerned, he was anxious, and so God gave him a glimpse into the plan. Here's the plan. Get your worship team together, let them practice real good, and then send them out in front of the army. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you, I just, I can picture the, Zac, the Zacchaeus and the Brookamy <laughs> of the Israeli people hearing these orders and, and looking at each other and saying, they want to kill us. <laughs> Do we want to do this? Isn't there another church we could go to? No, this was it. 
And so they sent out the army, but they sent out the, the worshipers first. And guess what? God fought their battle for them. This is how I fight my battle. I praise and worship God. That was the first line that came to her. This is how I fight my battle. The second line came from another story from the Old Testament when Elisha was surrounded by another army. His house was literally surrounded. And his servant was becoming very nervous, although Elisha was very calm. He was always, it seems, very calm. But the servant was nervous. He kept looking out of the window and saying, uh, you know, boss, uh, things aren't looking great. Uh, they've got lots of swords and chariots and horses. And um, I might, is there a back door to this place? <laughs> is there a way that I can somehow get out of here? I mean, it's all good for you. You're the one that said the things that got us into this. But I'm not feeling like too good about this. And so what did Elisha do? Elisha said, look again. And the servant looked again. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And if they were all around Elisha, then where were the enemy armies? Beyond the armies of fire that were surrounding them. And then the servant said, let's get them. Chase them down. Let's do this. What changed? His perspective. His perspective. Prayer and praise are tied together. One of the things that helped me the most and still helps me when I'm feeling anxious is worship. Sometimes I don't even feel like saying the words or singing the words, but I'll put it on. I have set up a Spotify playlist that's called Tyler's Chill. And whenever I get in one of those places, and actually I try every day, even if I'm not in one of those places, because preventative maintenance is better <laughs> than when you're in it. But songs that minister to me, to my heart, I remember so riding in the car when I was in the middle of all of this turmoil, trying to figure it out. And the song, We Fall Down, I don't know if you even remember that song. It's a, if you haven't heard it, the one by Bob Carlyle, the original version, is just, it just ripped my guts out every time. I just wept like a baby every time I would hear it because I was like, maybe, maybe God will help me get back up again. Because I felt like I was flat on my face. So if you're dealing with anxiety, pray. I don't mean just pray a prayer. Live a life of prayer. And second of all, thank God, praise God. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. And when we worship him, he inhabits the praises of his people. Both hands are involved in this way. One hand is the hand of prayer and the other hand is the hand of praise. When we pray, we raise one hand to God and we say, I surrender all. I surrender to you. And when we praise, we raise the other hand and we say, victory belongs to the Lord. And he's going to bring victory in this situation and circumstance. When we both raise both of them together, we're surrendering to a God who is fully able to bring the victory in whatever way he chooses to do it. It's already ours at that moment. You understand what I mean? It's like we already have the answer to the prayer before Amazon ever shows up at the door. We've gotten that notice that says, out for delivery when we raise our hands, when we praise and pray. And finally, we'll finish with this, proper thinking. Proper thinking. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our thoughts turn into action, right? There's nobody who just goes out and kills somebody without some form of thought being established within their mind, even if it's an instantaneous thought, right? So thoughts, what we think is very important, and what influences what we think is very important. What amount of time are we spending filling our minds with thoughts that are not thoughts from God? What percentage of time? We need to be careful with this. The Christian who fills their heart and mind with God's word will have a built-in radar for detecting wrong thoughts. When one comes our way, we can kick it out. We can get it out. I've dealt with people through the years who have, and I myself, even at one point in time, many, many years ago, dealt with, with, uh, with lust, with pornography. And it's interesting when you meet with somebody like that and you ask them, what are the practical steps that you have taken to make sure that you don't sin in this way? What do you mean? Did you remove cable or at least HBO from your, from your television? Yes or no? Do you still have internet? Well, yeah, I got to have internet. How bad do we want to be free? The Bible says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye, pluck it out. Now, obviously, we hope that those are just like metaphors or examples. But we should be that serious about it. If there's an area of thought in our life that is ruining our lives, do something different. Think about something different. So let's just run through these. True means not false or unreliable, but genuine and real. Noble means honorable or morally attractive. Think about these things. Just means righteous toward both God and man. Pure would refer to the high moral character of a person's life. Lovely has the idea of that which is admirable or agreeable to behold or consider. Admirable has also been translated of good repute or fair sounding. Excellent speaks of virtue and praiseworthy, something that deserves to be commended. Now, I ask you this question. What do all of those thoughts have in common? There's one commonality that we can find that will help us to focus our thinking. What do all of those things have in common? Who represents these things the very most and the very best? Jesus. My friends, Jesus is true. In fact, he's the way, the truth, and the life. He is noble. He is completely honorable in every way. Whatsoever things are just, he is called the just one. He is pure. The only pure individual who ever walked this earth was the Lord Jesus. If he understands how to think purely, Jesus does. He was lovely, which means he was gracious. How easy it would have been for him to condemn the world instead of to come and save it. He was admirable. People looked up to him. Even those who hated him had to show some form of respect at times. He was excellent. He is excellent. He has strength and he has courage. He was a man of courage, a real man. He took upon himself our humanity and he is praiseworthy. He is the one you can praise and worship and be right by doing it. My friends, the answer to changing the way that we think is to think about Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is all of the things that the scripture teaches us that we must think about. You will not get into trouble if your mind is focused completely on Jesus. My question is, how many days go by in a row without us even considering his name, 
without thinking about his attributes, his character, his nature, his holiness, who he is, and what he's done in our lives. How can we expect to not be anxious if we're not thinking about the very one who delivers us from anxiety and fear and worry? Every time Jesus or an angel arrive on the scene, what do they say? Do not be afraid. They don't come to bring fear. They come to bring peace to those who believe, to those who believe. Paul finishes this statement by saying that not only is, do we need peace with God and we need the peace of God, but we also understand that God is the God of peace. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. God describes himself in the word as the God of peace. And if the God of peace has chosen you as his child, and he walks with you and he talks with you and he's filled you with his spirit and he's given you the fruit of peace and we have the word of God that we can put into our hearts and into our minds so that we can think peaceful thoughts. And if he's given us the perfect image of Jesus to meditate on and to consider and to emulate, what in the world could steal our peace? Hebrews 13, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God not only teaches us or tells us to walk in our lives this way, he promises us that he will be with us. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Would you stand with me? I do want to reiterate one thing because I think it's important in the day and time we're living in. I have taken medication that was, has, was helpful to me when it came to my thoughts being so overwhelming and clouding my ability to separate out the thoughts that I was having. So it's not a sin. Let me give you an example. If you had a kidney disease and there was a medication that you could take or treatment that you could undergo that would help you, would you do that? In a similar way, if you have a chemical imbalance or a physiological situation or a psychological issue that's happening, it's not wrong necessarily to take medication for it, okay? I don't know who that's for, but I just want to say that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fan of pharmacy. I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying to you, sometimes the very practical things that God has provided are what we need to help us for a season. That makes sense? All right. We're going to pray now. I'm going to ask that you would really turn your attention to the Lord. I'm expecting to hear reports coming out of this service today, not because I've said anything, but because the Spirit of God is alive and well at Christmas and that the Prince of Peace is pouring himself out into this world again. So if you have need of peace, would you just raise your, however you want to present yourself to the Lord, just where you're at, just present yourself to the Lord now. If you know somebody that needs peace, let's pray for them this morning. Let's spend just a couple of minutes in prayer asking the Prince of Peace to give his peace as a gift to those who need it. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. Your word is true and it is alive and powerful. 
and it does what you have sent it to do. And so, Lord, we pray now in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for those who find themselves in the valley of despair, who are struggling, even like I spoke in the beginning of this message. They've experienced something recently that was very similar to that, and they feel overwhelmed and like there's no hope and there's no way out. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would intervene, that you would speak words of life and words of love to them, that you would send people across their path that would uh, recognize the situation and be willing to walk with them and help them in any way that they can. Father, we pray against the spirit of suicide and we command you in the name of Jesus to loose every person who finds themselves in a place of despair today. We say in the name of Jesus that you will not end the life of those whom God has chosen to be a part of his family. And we command you in Jesus' name to stop your assignment now against everyone in Jesus' name. We also pray, Lord God, for those who find themselves trapped in a way of thinking that causes them to have worry and fear and anxiety on a regular basis. We pray, Lord God, that the Prince of Peace would speak peace to them in the middle of the storm. Jesus, you who were asleep in the bottom of the boat, even though the storm was raging against you, you stood up and you said three words, peace, be still, and the wind and the waves obeyed you. And the the disciples understood for the first time maybe that you have control over every circumstance and situation in our lives. Father, help us to yield our control to you, that we would acknowledge you as our Lord and Savior, as our master, as the one who is greater than we are, as the one who knows the beginning from the end. Help us, Lord Jesus, to live lives that manifest the peace of God that passes all understanding. Lord, we pray that the things that bother us, that intrigue us, that grieve us, those things that overwhelm us on a daily basis, that they would begin to diminish, that in our eyes they would become like grasshoppers. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that the light of Jesus Christ and the authority of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit would seem like giants in comparison to the problems that we face and the anxiety that attempts to cripple us. Lord, we ask you, set us free that we might be free from this scourge upon our soul and upon our mind and upon our body in the name of Jesus. Make us who have been made free by the eternal Son of God walk in that freedom this day and every day. And we give you glory, honor, and praise even now for sending the result that we have asked you to send because we know that you are faithful to perform your word. And so, Lord, we ask now, grant your peace. Grant your peace. Pour out your peace in every living room right now that's watching every, every person who's holding their phone, maybe even uh, they're in a hotel or wherever they're at, Lord, and is watching this. Lord, we pray, pour out your peace. Overwhelm us with your peace. Let us be people who walk in peace, especially during this holiday season. Let us represent the Prince of Peace to this world around us in the mighty name of Jesus. And we thank you and we give you glory in the name of Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your peace. Thank you, Lord, for your peace. Praise you, God. Praise you, Father. I know I've gone a long time today and I was concerned about that, but I don't feel like there's anything I could really have left out. So I appreciate your patience. I believe that it's going to be important for us to do what we've heard today to do. And if you need help, we are all here to help. There's going to be a prayer team that'll be here. If you need specific prayer this morning, please come down and get that prayer. We love you guys. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name.